Do you get a picture of these folks as somehow being a little more compassionate to Jonah than Jonah would have been to them? Or than he is to the people in Nineveh? So, they throw Jonah overboard, and what happens? The sea is silenced, but not the sailors. Look at verses 15 and 16. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Whenever you see the word Lord spelled out in all caps in the Old Testament, that's a place where the name for God appears, Yahweh. This chapter begins with a group of sailors all worshiping different gods, all concerned about which one of their gods has been offended and has caused this calamity to happen. It ends with this group of sailors all focused on the one God, worshiping the Lord, sacrificing to the Lord, making vows to God the Lord. The harder Jonah tries to avoid preaching to pagans, the more they wind up being converted to God because of his recalcitrance. That's exactly what happens. The sea becomes calm, just like Jonah had said. And the chapter concludes with these sailors worshiping the Lord. Now, there are a lot of lessons we can get from the book of Jonah. But I think the most important lesson we can get from the first chapter is that our stereotypes about prophets don't always work. I don't know about you, but in, to me, in the first chapter of Jonah, Jonah's not the hero. He's the villain. The sailors are the ones who are being heroic, trying to save this man who's running away from God. Think about some differences between the two. The sailors, for example, you see them praying. Jonah's not praying. You see the sailors doing everything they can to save the ship and themselves. Jonah doesn't care. He's asleep. You see them showing compassion on Jonah, but Jonah's indifferent to their plight. They try to save Jonah. He doesn't care about them at all. They want to live. He wants to die. They want to find out whose sin has brought this terrible calamity on us. Jonah's only interest is in persisting in his sin, rebelling against God. They're obedient to what they knew. Disobedient. Job, Jonah is disobedient to what he knew. He's the one who knows the God of Israel. He is the one you'd expect to be obedient, but he's disobedient. They worship God. He doesn't. They shudder at his sin. What were you thinking? He doesn't care about his sin. Okay, my fault, my bad. Throw me in the drink. Their fear of God grows. He says, I fear the God of Israel, but he doesn't show any evidence that he's fearing God. Do you recall that Jesus was asked one time, what's the great commandment? Do you remember his answer? You can boil it down this way. Love God totally and love others unselfishly. That's in Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. When I look at this particular text in Jonah, I see sailors who love Jonah when Jonah doesn't love them. I see sailors who are concerned about appeasing the one true God when Jonah's not. They show more of obedience to the two great commands than Jonah does. Now, Jesus says that in Matthew chapter 22. In chapter 23, just a few verses later, Jesus says this. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. 
See that right there? This picture is taken in the ruins of the synagogue at Chorazin. Do you recall when Jesus said, Woe to you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? If the miracles that had been done in Tyre and Sidon had been done in them that you've seen, they would have repented a long time ago in sackcloth and ashes. Remember that? This is that city, Chorazin. This is from the synagogue in Chorazin. That particular item right there is called Moses' seat. I always wondered growing up when Jesus said, the scribes and Pharisees say sit in Moses' seat, so do what they say but don't do what they do. I always wondered what he meant by that. I just thought he meant they stand as representatives of Moses. When I was in Israel, I found out in the synagogues, just inside the entrance, was a seat. In fact, I have a picture of me sitting on that right there. I thought it was a little bit impious to put that picture up here, so I put just a picture of the seat itself. If you want to see the picture, I'll show you a picture of me sitting on it about 50 pounds ago. Anyway, um, this was the place that the person sat who presided over the synagogue service. And so what Jesus is saying is this. Listen to what they say when they speak because they know book, chapter, and verse. They know the scriptures. They teach the truth, but they pervert the truth in the way that they live. They don't live up to what they say. Does that sound like Jonah to you? Claims to be a prophet of God, but doesn't live up to what he says. They doesn't practice what he preaches. I debated and debated what verses to use from Romans chapter 2. Go home today and read Romans chapter 2. I could have picked any number of verses from Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2 basically says this. The Jews know what God expects. They have the Old Testament law. They have the teachings. They understand what the law requires. But they don't do what they know. And he says things like this. You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law as it is written? God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. If you were one of those sailors on that ship in that storm in the Mediterranean do you think Jonah's conduct would be more or less likely to cause you to give glory to God if you're one of those people living in Nineveh later in the book when you realize how Jonah detests you would that make you feel more or less inclined to worship the God that Jonah claimed to serve. So that's a problem. It's a problem for Jonah in the 8th century B.C. It's a problem for the Jews and Jewish Christians in the 1st century A.D. And it's a problem for us. I can't tell you how many times, and you've seen it too, People in the name of Christ take all kinds of anti-Christian and un-Christian attitudes that cause people to just recoil away from the God we claim to serve. We're going to close today with a song. And that song gives us each an opportunity to reflect on Jonah and ourselves. One of the elders is going to be back at the door by the middle school classroom if anyone needs to talk to someone, but maybe it's just a matter of us individually saying to God, help me to be what I ought to be. Help me to be more like you want me to be and less like Jonah. As we sing the song, this will lead us to the conclusion of our service. If you need to respond in some way, go ahead. I told, I told Lynn this morning I wasn't going to do invitations anymore. I've noticed that lately the folks that have been replacing me haven't done them. And I've thought about the fact that in the, old, in the New Testament, you know, you don't find anything about an invitation song in the New Testament. Matter of fact, the preachers just preached until somebody interrupted them. And Lynn says, you're not going to start doing that, are you? I might. 
But as we sing this song with the assistance of Keith Lancaster, think about your own relationship to the Lord. And if you need to make any changes we can help you with, let us know how.